Chapter 6 Johnny Curry was a careful man, but you couldn't run a criminal organization as large as his and not get noticed. By 1984, a joint task force of the FBI and Detroit police had opened an investigation into the Curry's operation. Agents were arresting addicts and low-level dealers and squeezing them for information about the crew. Others in the trade talked in hopes of cultivating a friend in the FBI in case of future trouble. Dry cleaning themselves, agents called it, or just an easy hundred dollars. Soon the task force moved on to making controlled buys from the Curry's drug houses, assembling evidence to take to a judge for a warrant. Eventually, agents broke into Johnny Curry's home and basement office undetected and bugged his phone. In 1987, a federal grand jury returned an indictment against Johnny and Leo, along with Boo Curry and 18 others, on an array of charges, including operating a continuing criminal enterprise. A couple of weeks after Johnny Curry went to jail to await trial, his wife, Kathy Volson, came and knocked on the door at the Wershe house. The street was in disbelief when Wershe, just 17 to Volson's 24, started stepping out with Volson on his arm. Messing with a kid like that, one curry lieutenant told me. Were she, he said, was just not her caliber. Were she knew Johnny would be irate. But by then, he says, my head was so big, I didn't care. The relationship proved tempestuous. Once, when Volson suspected were she of cheating, she drove a butcher knife into the bathroom door while he stood on the other side, he claims. Volson has not spoken to journalists in years, and I was unable to reach her. But on a better day, two months into the affair, she bought Worshi a five-carat diamond ring for his birthday. Worshi had used Johnny Curry's connections in other ways, too. In 1986, through the Currys, he met a man named Art Derrick, who truly played in the cocaine big leagues. Derek and his partner were the leading volume dealers in the city. In an interview with William Adler, whose land of opportunity is the definitive account of the Chambers brothers' rise and fall, Derek estimated that he and his partner cleared $100,000 a day in profit for more than two and a half years. They supplied the bold-faced names of the city's drug trade, guys like Maserati Rick and Demetrius Holloway. At the time, Derek, who died in 2005, was in his mid-thirties, a slovenly man with a pockmarked face and a droopy mustache. He was the only other white guy in Wershe's orbit, a big talker who lived large. Art Derek kept a private jet in the ghetto, dude, Wershe told me. Derek had four planes, actually, one of them formerly owned by the Rolling Stones. His house, just beyond the city limits in Harper Woods, was surrounded by a seven-foot white brick wall topped with electric fencing. His basement had white marble floors and mirrored walls and ceilings. He had a speedboat and a swimming pool with his initials inlaid in the tile. Derek took a liking to Wershey, who also knew his son, a preppy kid who sold drugs to friends in Gross Point. Derek brought Wershey on trips to Miami, renting out half a floor at the airport Hilton. Worshi bought a jet ski. They would go to a Cuban steakhouse and Joe's Stone Crab. They'd get call girls. Derek would bring Worshi with him to Vegas, too, where the kid, still not yet 18, would stay in Derek's condo at the jockey club. He was almost like a son to me, Derek told Adler. Derek was flying in the cocaine from suppliers in Miami, where the price was much lower than in Detroit allowing for a serious markup. Soon where she was bypassing Derek and getting his product, he says, directly from a major Miami dealer. At the height of Wershey's career, his connection would send him and his associates shipments as large as 50 kilos, which at the time would sell in Detroit at around 17,000 per kilo. The local retail price was dropping fast. With crack at its peak, Opportunists were flooding the market, trying to get in on the boom. In Wershe's neighborhood, he recalls, 
a man who worked on the line at General Motors, was moonlighting as a dealer. So was an assistant principal at an elementary school. Supply was outstripping demand. By now, Worshi did not generally deal to users or even have underlings do it for him. He was not a retailer or a gang leader, but a so-called weight man. He sold in quantities of a kilo or more, usually, to other dealers. If his buyers turned the cocaine into crack and sold it in small dollar amounts, the street value of those original 50 kilos could run into the millions. He rose all the way through the ranks, B.J. Chambers says. He did it just as big as me, the Curry Brothers, Maserati Rick, whoever you want to name. Worshi was now prominent enough to be a target. One day in the spring of 1987, he was riding in the passenger seat of a convertible with a friend. When they pulled up at a stoplight, Worshi noticed a van pulling alongside them, its side door sliding open. Worshi shouted at his friend to run the red light, then reached his foot over and hit the accelerator himself, ducking the hail of bullets as the convertible peeled out across the intersection. Nate Boone Craft, an enforcer from the notoriously violent Best Friends gang, later admitted to pulling the trigger. While rivals threatened Worshi from one side, the law was closing in from the other. In Detroit and nationwide, all eyes were now on the crack epidemic. Politicians were vying to show how tough they could be on drugs, and law enforcement in Detroit was under pressure to produce. The no-crack crew and the Detroit police had Worshi in their sights by 1987. He'd sold $1,600 in cocaine to an undercover DEA agent at his father's house the previous September. Subsequent raids aimed at Worshi turned up all the makings of a serious drug operation, scales, a money-counting machine, cash, and weapons, but produced only one charge against him for possession of a small amount of cocaine. Now the police were pulling him over on flimsy pretexts, he says, to see if they could find something on him. Where she was a prize for any cop who could bring him down. His run couldn't last. <laughs>